Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbal, upon the high sounding cymbal. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. You are great and we are small. But you still care for us all. You're so mighty, we're so weak. Mm -hmm. But we've never been defeated. We are deserving. We are not worthy. We never earned it, no. But you have shown great grace. Where would I be if it had not been for you? Mm. Where would I be if it had not been for you? You are great. But you, but you still care for us all. You're so mighty, we're so weak. You're so mighty, we're so weak. But we've never been defeated.
I've been for you. Oh, 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 oh. Somebody had to open up your mouth right where you are. If God has been graceful to you, you ought to give him the fruit of your lips. Come on and open up your mouth right where you are in your living room in this sanctuary. If he in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is Pastor Williams and as always we greet you with Jesus joy. Again it is our joy to bring you the word of God this weekend and we hope and pray that once again this word is tailor-made to fit your circumstance and situation. So enjoy the word of God and I'll see you on the other side of the worship. Get started. Y'all ready for the word today? Yeah. Amen. Join hands with those around you now as we prepare with prayer. For the word of God, after we will have prayed, would you remain on your feet for the reading of God's word? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, praise you, honor, and glorify you because, God, there is none like you in all of the universe. God, you are in a class by yourself. Nobody voted you in. Nobody can vote you out. For that, oh God, we give you praise, honor, and glory for being God. We thank you for being good. If we could find a better word, we'd say it, God, because you have been good in our lives. Every time we turn around, Lord, you keep on blessing us. For that, we give you honor and praise, oh God. There's not enough words in the human lexicon to describe. If we had 10,000 tongues in a million years, we couldn't thank you enough for being so good to us. Now, God, be in this place. We know you're everywhere. Manifest your everywhere in this. Flex your muscles in your own house. Let the enemy know who's in charge. Feel this sanctuary so full of your power and presence that there's no quarter for the enemy to operate. Fix and focus our mind and attention on you today. God, we want to know, is there a word from you? Speak in this place. If you speak bow down heads will be lifted if you speak faith will be restored if you speak joy will come back off vacation lord if you speak something will happen in this place now god as we prepare to hear your word we pray that as the seed of your word is sown that the soil of our soul will be receptive to that seed and with time and tending bring forth the fruit of the character and conduct of christ because lord we want to be like jesus in our hearts. Now, God, finally, I pray for me. God, you called me. You know all about me. Let no flaws, faults, or failures in me hinder the free-flowing movement of your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, don't penalize your people for anything in me that is not like you. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And if there be any wicked way in me, cast it out and lead me in the way that is eternal. Take my mind. Lord, think with my mind. My mouth, Lord, speak with my mouth and maybe my voice, but let it be your words, I pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And God, we will be careful to give your name praise, your name honor, your name glory, for you and you alone are worthy of the highest praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' mighty name we ask it. For his sake we do pray. All who agree with that prayer say amen. Come on, put your hands together one more time for the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Amen. If you have your Bibles with me, turn in your Bible or tap in your app to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 
chapter 16, verse 1. Just want to deal with one verse today, small bite for lunch, just a soup and sandwich today. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. Amen. 1 Samuel 16, 1. Amen. Turn in your Bible, tap in your app. There is a word there for the church. 1 Samuel 16, 1, if you found it, say amen. Beginning with verse 1, reading just verse 1 in the New International Version of the Hebrew text. If you turn there, you find these words. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. With the help of the Holy Spirit in your presence, I want to talk to you for this theme, get over it. <laughs> get over it. <laughs> Amen. I need some help with that one, y'all. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor and tell him, get over it. <laughs> Ooh, Lord, we could go home. That was a word all by itself. <laughs> Lord, look at your other neighbor and tell him, it's time to get over it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get over it. Shoot, let's just open the doors of the church. That, that's good all by itself. Get over it. Amen. In our text today, we have a snapshot out of the life and times of the judge or the prophet Samuel. And anyone who knows anything about the background and bio data of this prophet Samuel knows that Samuel comes from good spiritual stock. The Bible tells us who his mother is. You have an idea of why he turned out the way he did because of the mother he had. His mother was named Hannah, and Hannah was one of the two wives of the man named Elkanah, who was married to both Hannah and to Penina. And uh, Hannah uh, had something that grieved her heart, and that was she could not have children. The Bible talks about the degree of her faith and the potency of her prayer. She believed in the power of prayer. What is often interesting is when we examine the life of Hannah and the fact that she prayed for a child and even though her body said she couldn't have one and people believed she couldn't have one, God answered her prayer, we often forget a very important detail. And that is one of the things that prompted and persuaded her to pray with such passion for this thing that she had longed for was Panina, the other wife. The Bible says that Panina provoked her. Isn't that something? It was bad enough that she couldn't have the baby, but the Bible says that Panina, who lived in the same house with her, provoked her. This is how she provoked her. The Bible says that Panina could have, could do, could accomplish, could produce what Hannah apparently had not or could not produce. In other words, she could have a baby. So every time she got pregnant, she paraded her pregnancy in front of Hannah. And she provoked her. Look at what I can do. You can't do what I can do. Sometimes she didn't have to say anything. She just walked around pregnant, smiling and pregnant. Hannah would be in the rooms you know, sitting down and she walked by the open door. Her stomach would show up first. And she walked by with a smile on her face and keep on going. She was, somebody say provoked. And what I want to suggest to you today is that as bad as that was, as mean as that was, that was critical to the passion that Hannah had to finally produce something that she had not produced so far. I want to suggest to you that if it hadn't been for the provocation of Panina, maybe Hannah would not have prayed so passionately for what she wanted. But I'm suggesting to you sometimes we are able to reach our potential or accomplish things that ordinarily we would not have accomplished or even give up on something that we 
uh, would not have given up on all because somebody provoked us. <laughs> somebody said you couldn't do it and just because they said you couldn't do it, you decided you was going to prove that you could do it. Somebody said you couldn't have it and because they kept denying it of you, they provoked you to press harder. It was hard. You had to cry. You had to weep. You had to mourn sometimes and sometimes you almost gave up. But at the moment you gave, about to give up, they provoked you again. Sometimes some the greatest things accomplished were accomplished because somebody provoked you. In fact, justice, one of the reasons why we don't have segregation anymore, or at least legal segregation, is because people were provoked to do something about it. Dr. King was minding his own business, going to school, but he got provoked by whites only signs and denial of justice and equity and equality for people and so he got provoked and what even provoked him further is that when he tried to correct the problem he was met with force water hoses and dogs but that didn't stop him soaking wet and even arrested he was just provoked to try harder and in fact he prophetically pronounced the people who are determined to deny him justice he said about segregation segregation is on his deathbed and the only thing uncertain about it is how costly the segregation is going to make the funeral in other words it doesn't matter what you do because you keep denying what is rightfully mine I'm going to keep on you provoking me somebody say provoked you know, we used to have a guy on our basketball team who was a tall, skinny white dude. And when he played with us, he just didn't play hard. He played soft. You know, we were trying to make him a good basketball player. So when he came in the inside, we'd push him around and talk about him and tell him how soft he was and how he wasn't any good. But every day he would show back up. And he was determined to prove us wrong. And I remember he was about a grade lower than me. And when I graduated, I went back to watch one of the high school games. You should have saw the way this brother was playing. He was dangerous. I saw a brother throw a ball on the inside. He grabbed it. Somebody tried to stop him. He dunked it right over. I said, that looks like the same dude, but he don't play like the same dude. Can I tell you why he ended up being as good as he was? It's because somebody provoked him. Come on, and listen, in the text, that Panina meant it for evil, but Hannah used it for good, which means, reminds us that sometimes God can use the devil's oven to bake his bread. Sometimes when people mean it for evil, you don't have to use it for what they mean it for, you use it for good. Can I flip the script because this is Women's Month? Can I flip it right quick? Look at one woman provoking another woman to be productive. A positive way of looking at this is that you don't have to be negative in your provocation. If you see potential in somebody and they don't see it themselves or they have questions about their own potential, you need to provoke them to do well. Provoke them not only by talking right to them, but by producing in your own life to be a source of inspiration for them to rise to the heights that God has above them and live up to the best that God has. And if you want to be a good friend to somebody, provoke them to live up to the best that God has in them. The Bible, somebody shout provoked. Yeah, you, yeah, the Bible says she was provoked and because she was provoked, she prayed. She prayed hard. In fact, she prayed so hard, the Bible says, one day she was at church and uh, Eli saw her praying. The priest there saw her praying. And the Bible says when Eli saw her, he saw her praying. He didn't hear any sound, but he saw her lips moving. He concluded that she had been drinking. He, he said, woman, you ought to be ashamed of yourself in church like that, all intoxicated. She stopped praying long enough to say, no, Reverend, uh, I'm not drunk. I haven't been pouring wine. I'm pouring my soul out to God because there's something I want. And God hadn't said no yet. Now, God hadn't said anything yet. But as long as God hadn't said no, I'm going to keep on praying for this. I want a child. And so she kept on pouring her soul. Now, Panina kept provoking. She kept on pouring. And the priest said to her, Reverend said to her, he said, I hope the Lord blesses you real good. The Bible says she went home. Her husband slept with her. And she got pregnant. Now, watch this. Because the next thing that happens tells you something about kind, quality, and character of this woman. The Bible says when she had the baby. When God gave her the baby, she gave the baby back to God. 
Woo, Lord, have mercy. And you know what? I got a sneaking suspicion that one of the reasons why God gave her the baby is God knew what she was going to do with it. God said, I'm going to give you this because I can trust you with this. Because I know if I give it to you, you will give it back to me. Can I just pause here at this point in preaching and poll the house and ask you a question? If God gave you what you want, what would you do with it when you got it? Mm, 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 mm. You want the position, you want the opportunity, you want the house, you want the car, you want the chance. Well, what are you going to do with it when you get it? Because on the one hand, while some of you will do it, you will give it back to God. That is, when God blesses you with it, you're going to say to God, okay, God, I don't have amnesia. I remember who gave this to me. And so I'm going to give it back to you by using it in a way that honors you. This money, I'm going to use it to honor you. This house, I'm going to use it to honor you. This car, I'm going to use it to honor you. This opportunity, that open door, I'm going to use it to honor you. But... There's another percentage of people in here today that if God gave you what you're asking for, he would never see you again. Because as soon as you got it, you get amnesia. You wouldn't come to church on Wednesday. You wouldn't even come on the weekend anymore. You stop praying like you because you be so busy enjoying the blessing that you forget about the blesser who blessed you with the blessing. And maybe God is doing you a favor by making you wait for it so you can work hard for it so you can appreciate it when you give it and learn, remember where you got it from. The Bible says he gave the baby back, and the baby happened to be Samuel. The Bible says she gave her child back to God by taking him to the temple after he had been weaned and letting Eli raise him in the temple. And so the Bible says she gave him to Eli and said, I, I'm giving my boy back to God because he gave him to me. And it was while he was being raised there by Eli, he's being mentored by Eli, the Bible says that everybody from Dan to Bathsheba, the Bible says, realized that he was a prophet of God. It was obvious that Samuel was a prophet. In fact, this is what God says about in his word about Samuel, that God did not let Samuel's words fall to the ground. I like that. The Bible says that whenever he spoke, whatever he said came to pass. God didn't let his words be in vain. You know why? Because when he spoke, he wasn't speaking his own words. Before he put his mouth to the ear of the people, he put his ear to the mouth of God. He let God speak through him, spoke to him, and he simply repeated whatever God told him to say. And listen, when it's his word, God's word, and not your word, you don't ever have to worry about the results. Because if God says it, it's got to happen. God said, he said, my word, I like this, does not go out and come back void, but it's going to stay out there till it accomplishes what it's set out to do. Now, the reason why you ought to be shouting today is if you've ever been given a promise by God, if the promise has not come to fruition yet, do not get discouraged because that word is still out there working on your behalf and it's going to work and work and work until it happens the way God says so because the Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. Look at your neighbor and say, I know that's right. Yeah, yeah. So Samuel was a prophet of God. And he was a prophet during a time when they were bridging the gap between the time that they were the judges and the time they had their first king. And Samuel was the judge. He was the prophet who would be the one who would anoint the first couple of kings of Israel. The people of God were looking around and they said, we want to be like other nations. We want a king like other nations. Samuel tried to discourage him according to one record in the Bible. And they insisted, we want to be like other nations. We want a king to lead us in battle like other nations. Samuel went to God and God said, go on and give them what they want. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. He said, but go on and give them what they want. I'll acquiesce. I am God. I'll acquiesce. I'll give them what they want. And that's what he does. And you know, sometimes I think God gives us what we insist on just to teach us that it ain't what you think it is. Ooh. You know, the scariest words I've ever read in the Bible is in the New Testament where it says, and God gave them up to reprobate my he gave them up that means that God was saying no 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 and they insisted so God stepped aside 
and said, okay, you can have it. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I know me enough to know that the last thing I want God to do is to leave me to my own devices. Y'all, y'all can be holy if you want to, but I need God to stand in front of me every now and then and say, fool, you are going in the wrong direction. Whatever you do, God, don't leave me alone. If you got to wake me up at night, if you got to convict me in church, whatever you do, don't leave me to myself because I know what my life looks like in my own hands. I don't want my life to be in my own hands. I need my life to be in your hands. Is there anybody in here whose testimony is the same? Yes, Lord. He said, go on and give the king they want. And so they found the king. They found the king. His name was Saul. Let church say Saul. Yeah, the Bible says he was tall, dark, and handsome. In fact, he was so tall that he was head and shoulders over the rest. He looked like a king. He walked like a king. So on the outside, he looked like a king. But on the inside, he was dealing with some insecurities. The Bible says they chose the king and Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him to be king. But he, he messed up. Now, he wouldn't have been the first nor the last king to mess up. But he messed up in a real critical way apparently. The Bible says he told him on one occasion to destroy, to fight the Amalekites, the people who threatened the, the people of God while they were coming through the wilderness. He said wipe them out. And all the livestock, kill all the livestock as well. So he went out, but he didn't do what God said. He kept the king alive, and he kept the best of the livestock. And then when the prophet came back and said, uh, did you do what God said? He said, yeah, we did exactly just what God said do. He said, but I hear the bleeding of sheep, and I hear the lowing of oxen. He said, you didn't do what God said do. If you did, I wouldn't hear these animals. He said, well, you, you know, what we did was, see, what had happened was <laughs> that we didn't count on the livestock being that good. So what I decided to do is I decided to go ahead and keep the best, take some of it and offer it to God as a sacrifice. He said, God didn't ask you to offer him any sacrifices. He said, God told you to do what he said obedience he said is better than sacrifice can I put a comma here I ain't gonna stop I just want to pause a minute when God gives you something to do listen you can't do it your way the wrong way and then think you can break off a little bit of it and give it to God and think you can bribe God with it I wish I had some help in here ain't no right way to do wrong preach pastor I already am and the Bible says he says because you disobeyed me he says, God has taken the nation from you. And, and Saul said, I'm sorry. He said, I wouldn't have done it. Watch this. He said, but the people, they wanted it. The people wanted it. And I think this is one of the reasons why he lost his leadership is because he was more concerned about what the people wanted than he was about what God commanded. And listen, your spiritual leadership is always threatened when you're more concerned about what people think. I wish I could preach this like I feel it. Than you are about what God thinks. And, and I'm talking about spiritual leadership. And not just in the church. One of the reasons why our children are in the situation, position, and got the attitudes and behavior they have is because we got parents who are more concerned about what your children think about what you're doing than doing what's in their best interest. Preach, Pastor Williams. They, you so busy trying to be their friend. They got enough friends. They need a parent. Talk to me, somebody. And the parent doesn't just say yes. Sometimes a parent says no. Come on, talk to me. A parent doesn't always tell you what you want to hear. A parent tells you what you need to hear. A parent doesn't always feed you what you want to eat. Your parent says, sit down and eat this because this is good for you. Well, I don't want that. Well, if you don't eat that, you're going to bed hungry. Y'all can't handle this. Some of y'all got six kids and six different meals. The devil is a liar. Somebody say old school. Yeah, I'm old school. My mama said, this is the meal. This is what we eating tonight. Sit down and enjoy this meal. But I don't like this. Well, you ain't got to eat it, but ain't nothing else in the house. Can I preach this like I feel it? 
need spiritual leadership when it comes to churches. You need people in pulpits who will not pander to your pleasures. You want somebody who's not just going to scratch you where you itch. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You don't need somebody who's always going to preach so you can feel better. You want somebody who can preach so you can live better. You don't want somebody who's going to preach a gospel that is adjusted to fit the demands of your lifestyle. You want to fit the demands of your lifestyle into the demands of the gospel. Am I right about it? You don't need people in pulpits who practice the supermarket principle that the customer is always right. The devil is a liar. The customer is not always right. In fact, there are going to be times, and I already told Base Memorial this, I love them with all my heart, life, and soul, but there's going to be times when you ain't going to want to shake my hand after service. You ain't going to go away talking about, he sure did preach, did you know? You're going to leave here and say, he must have been in a bad mood today. I wonder what's wrong with Reverend today. <laughs> because sometimes the medicine that helps you does not taste good going down. Some diseases need for you to be cut before you can be cured. God, I wish I had some help in here. That's what an operation is. Somebody cutting on you. Now, it's different. The fact that somebody has a knife in your hand doesn't mean that they're trying to hurt you. Now, if you're in an alley and they got a switchblade, that's different. But if you're on an operating bed and they got a scalpel... Same principle, different motive. One person is trying to hurt you, but somebody else is trying to cure you, but the cut has to precede the cure because the cut is necessary for them to remove what doesn't belong there. And sometimes when you're in church, don't you feel like squirming in your seat because you ain't shouting because it feels good. You feel like you're getting cut. But go on and let God do the operation because after he cuts you, he'll take the needle of love and the thread of hope. He'll bind you, mend you, and send you. Look at your neighbor and tell him, thank God for the word. Because the Bible says the word is like a scalpel. It's like a two-edged sword. It cuts coming and going. It pierces the dividing, even asunder of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Watch this. And is even a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, which means that you can come to church and put on a front and fool people. But when that truth goes out there, it goes all past the pretense, underneath the mask. Oh, y'all don't hear me. Somebody say, thank God for the word. So the Bible says, he told him, he said, he said Saul went to, Samuel went to Saul and said, God has taken the nation from you. You're more concerned about people than God. And Samuel turns to walk away from Saul and Saul grabs him by his robe and it rips. And Samuel turns back to him and said, just like this ripped in your hands, he said, God has ripped the nation out of your hand. The Bible says he goes away. And then chapter 16 comes. And the Bible is, says God is talking not to Saul, but he's talking to Samuel. And he says, Samuel, what is your problem? He said, why are you still mourning about Saul when you know I have rejected him. Why are you still? Now, it would be normal, natural, healthy, and human for Samuel to grieve about Saul. He had a lot of emotional investment in Saul. He was hoping the best for Saul. The whole nation was. He loved Saul, but it didn't work out, and it wasn't God's fault or Samuel's fault. But it was all right. It was normal for him to mourn and grieve over the loss, but God is saying uh, the pain is normal, but you can't let the pain of what would have been paralyze your progress to what towards God, what God wants to be. Y'all are missing this. See, 
He is a prophet in everything, but he's emotionally stuck about what happened in the past. God says, I've got a brighter future ahead of you, but you cannot experience it and not moving in the direction of it because you are too stuck on what could have been in the past. So you will never drive towards my destiny if you're still looking in the rearview mirror. And isn't it interesting that the largest glass in the car is the windshield and the smallest glass is the rearview mirror. Which means that you're supposed to stare out of the windshield and only glass at the glance at the rearview mirror some folk got it backwards they are staring at the rearview mirror and only glancing at the windshield listen you cannot drive looking backwards i wish i could get some help in here oh no you're gonna wreck your car you'll never make it to your destination driving looking in the rearview mirror the only time you ought to look in the rearview mirror is to glance at it to help you maneuver your way to getting towards your future. I wish I had some help in it. Sometimes you got to look in it because sometimes you got to back up. Somebody say back up. And somebody, that was a word. I felt that that was a word for somebody right now. You stuck where you are and God said you can get unstuck if you would just glance in the rearview mirror and back up. But only back up so you can reorient yourself to go forward. Preaching here, Holy Ghost. Somebody say back up. So you got to just back up, use it right quick, and then retrace your steps a little bit to get your bearing. But you only do that, not so you can stay stuck, but so that you can reorient yourself to better move forward. And he's saying you are so preoccupied with the past. He said there is no anointing for that. There's no empowerment for that. There's no plan or strategy for that. That is not going to get any better. It's not going to change. You can stay here and cry over that mischance, over that dead relationship. <laughs> and you mad because you don't have nobody in your life. Well, the, David is up the road, but you can't get to David because you still stuck on Saul. See if this is on. I can't get no help. Sometimes God does you a favor by saying, quit looking at Saul. There's something, look at your neighbor tell him there's something better ahead. He said, you crying and snotting and fussing and complaining. People don't even like to be around you no more because every time they're around, you saw this and saw that and saw the other. And they say, oh, here he come. Here she come again. And they try to avoid you because they are so tired of hearing about what happened in the past. I mean, people will help you. People will love you through some stuff, but they want you to get through some stuff. I know this seems kind of hard. I'm just trying to help you. Paul said, here is the key to spiritual progress. Here it is. Forgetting those things which are behind. Reaching to those things which are before. I press, he said, toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, if you were to look at my life from the side, you will see that I am not leaning back when I run. I'm leaning forward when I run. In fact, everything about me anatomically is pointed forward. My eyes are pointed forward. My nose are pointed forward. My mouth is pointed forward. My ears are tilted forward. My hands and arms work better forward. My my feet are pointing forward. The only thing behind me is what I need to eliminate anything that's keeping me from going forward. Somebody gonna get that Thursday. You were built to move forward. Your best days are not behind you. Your best days are ahead of you. He said, I've already you still worried about Saul. He said, I've already chosen another king. I already got the replacement. I already got the new job. I already got the new boo. 
already got the new opportunity. But you can't see it because you're trying to walk backwards. Look at your neighbor and tell him, turn around. <laughs> he said, I got a future for you that's going to blow your mind. How long you going to stay here? He said, get your oil. Somebody said, get your oil. He said, get the horn full of oil. He said, I got a king I need you to anoint. Watch this. He said, go to Jesse's house. I'm almost finished. He said, go to Jesse's house because the king is at Jesse's house. He tells them where the king is. He doesn't tell them who the king is. Because sometimes when God gives you directions, he doesn't give you all the details. And the reason why he doesn't give you all the details is because you're still in trust training. He's trying to teach you how to trust him even without all the information. Is there anybody in here who's got a history with God and God has proven to you that even though you don't have all the details, he can still be trusted? Oh my God, I feel like preaching now. Look at your neighbor and say, trust God. You say, but I don't understand it. If I could understand it, then I would believe it. And I'm trying to tell you, if you believe it, then you can understand it. Look at your neighbor and tell him, just walk, just walk, just walk, just walk, just walk, just walk. He, so he went to Jesse's house. Watch the text. The Bible says he went to Jesse's house. He said, Lord, sit me here because the king is here. He said, where are your boys at? He said, I got a lot of boys. He said, where are they at? Sure. And so the Bible says he started parading his sons before him. When he saw the first one. He saw Eliab. Eliab was tall and handsome like Saul. And Samuel said, that's got to be him. And God said, that ain't him. He said, you hadn't learned yet? He said, they chose Saul because he was tall and handsome. He says, the problem is men look on the outward appearance. He said, but God looks at the heart. He said, you're looking at the wrong thing. God, I wish I had time to work this out because you know our lives would be less complicated if we would talk to God about some choices we make because some of us, we can't be trusted with our own choices because we're too superficial in the analysis. We need somebody like God to teach us how to look below the surface to things that really matter. He said, no, he ain't the one. So he brought a second one. All of them look good. All of them look kingly. Five, six, seven. He said, God said, mm -mm. No, I'm almost finished. He said, none of them. And he said, I know God sent me here. <laughs> Have you ever been in a situation like that where you say, I know this is where I'm supposed to be. And I know this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I know what God told me. And I know what I'm looking for, but I don't see it. Look at your neighbor and say, stay put. Because some people say, well, maybe I need to change my... Uh-uh. If you know you were, you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to do, even if you don't see what you expect to see, stay there and keep looking for it. I don't care how long it takes. And I know somebody can't hear this because you've been waiting so long, searching for it so long. But listen, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. The Bible says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, wait a while. Yeah, keep on waiting. The Bible says, he said, he said, I know God sent me here. I'm almost finished. And he said, you got another boy? And Jesse said, well, yeah. <laughs> As if to say, but you can't mean him. I wish I had time. Because you can only imagine how David must have felt about how his family felt about him. You know, my family's opinion of me is important. I, could, I almost don't care what you think about me. But when my family, their opinion about me helps shape my own image of me when I was growing up. And apparently, they didn't put too much stock in David, neither his brothers or his father. So when this prophet came looking for the king, they brought all the sons except David. 
And while the sons were being paraded before the prophet, David was on the backside of the Judean hills keeping his daddy Jesse's sheep. But can I help you with this? Even though people don't acknowledge you, and even, God, when people try to hide you, they can't put you anywhere where God can't find you. I'm trying to help somebody in here. Because, see, you on the job, and you know God has put you on a job for a particular place or position, but they put you in the basement in the smallest office, and nobody knows you're there except God. And listen, when God decides something is supposed to happen in your life no devil in hell can stop it from happening I thought I'd get more amens than that the prophet said well go get him because I ain't leaving till I see him somebody said word uh, he's keeping the sheep and what's interesting is he's doing with the sheep God what God wants him to do with his people uh, he was on the back side of the hills but he didn't know he was in training for something greater that's why you should never be over don't be depressed about what you're doing right now because you might be there because God is preparing you for something greater so while you are there you need to give it everything you got because if you are faithful over a few things God hey, will make you ruler over many he, he, he said, he said, your daddy wants you. They said, service out. said, David, he said, yeah. He said, your daddy wants you. And, and so he at the house with, with, with Reverend Samuel. He said, okay, where, where are my brothers at? They're already there. So he put the sheep in the corral. He didn't even wash or anything. He came smelling like sheep. <laughs> Barefoot, nappy head. Just come in. Just <laughs> Still got his rod and his staff. Yes, daddy. And as soon as Samuel saw him, he said, there he is. <laughs> Dude, help me preach this. Look at your people next to you. Look at your neighbor. Point at him and say, there he are. Yeah, 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 yeah. You the one. <laughs> Let me help you. You the one, in case you were sitting by next to somebody and they didn't do what I asked you. Let me point at you. You are the one that God is looking for. You keep wondering who is God going to choose to help deal with the hell in the world. I'm trying to tell you, don't ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Look at your other neighbor and point at him. God is after you. God is looking for you. God wants you. He said, I've been, God's been waiting on you. He said, I almost left, but I know God sent me here for you. He said, he was ruddy and handsome, still with the smell of sheep on him. And he said, come here, boy, bow your head. And he took that oil and poured that oil over David's head. Oh, you missed your shout. He, he the youngest one, he was left out disregarded, pushed to the periphery, kicked to the curb, but look at the oil. Y'all don't hear me? Because I don't care who you are. You can't do what God wants you to do without the oil. Is there any oily saints in here? Because the oil symbolizes the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you can't do God's work without God's help. And what God needs in the world is he needs some oily saints. He needs some saints who've been drenched with the power of God. Because see, if you got the anointing, you can take a licking and keep on ticking. If, if you got the anointing, you're not easily discouraged. You don't wave the white flag of surrender. You may have some cuts. You may have some bruises. But if you get tired, you just rest. If you get cut, you just heal. If you get knocked down, you just pray while you're down there. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God for the oil. Just think, if Samuel had stayed stuck in the past, David would never have been anointed. What I'm trying to tell you is you can't be like, you can't stay stuck 
Because God has some people whose lives he wants you to influence. There's some Davids and some Davidettes out there who need somebody to point to them and say, I believe God has something for you. Am I right about it? And I don't know how you feel about it, but the reason why I have the mic in my hand today in part is because there was somebody in the church who had a spirit of discernment. And when other people didn't see it, and I didn't see it myself, they said, come here, boy. I see God all over you. Has that happened to anybody in the church? I remember when I was a little boy, the Bible, uh, uh, my father told me that one day when we were at Peace Baptist Church in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, I was a little boy about nine years old, and I was singing in the choir, and I had a solo to sing. And uh, my daddy told me uh, they were bringing the preacher in, but they weren't in the sanctuary yet. They were waiting in the room that led to the sanctuary. Said the preacher heard my voice and said, who is that boy? And my daddy said, that's my youngest son. He said, God's got something for that boy. Y'all not, y'all not hearing what I'm trying to say. I, I remember them old saints, them old mothers who used to come up to me and look at me in the face and say, you got the mark. And I'll be talking about, no, I don't have no more. But they could see something. Y'all not hearing me. That I couldn't even see myself. Which means that by the time God started speaking to my heart, not only could I hear God speak, but I'd already had confirmation of people telling me, I know that God has his hand on you. And what I'm trying to tell you is you ain't got to have reverend or bishop or deacon or minister or apostle in front of your name in order for God to have his hand on you. So just pretend like I'm Samuel today. And God sent me here to tell everybody in the building that God has his hand on you. That God has a purpose and a plan for your life. That you've got a special anointing on your life. And it's up to you to find out what God has for you. Because the Bible says that after David got anointed to be king of Israel, he did not go and sit on the throne. But they sent him right back out there to take care of those sheep. Y'all not hearing me. Because you may be anointed, but you may not get to your appointment just because you're anointed. Because God has some a purpose for your life God will put you through a process to prepare you for where you're headed look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor I'm in the process come on I may be up today I may be down tomorrow but just because I'm down don't mean God has given up on me I'm still in the process and I'm trying to tell somebody in here today you may have fallen flat on your face you may have embarrassed yourself so bad that it's gone public but I don't care what people think about you God is not finished with you yet look at your neighbor and tell him I may be down but I'm still in the process please be patient with me God is not through with me yet but let the church say but but when he gets through with me I shall come forth as pure gold somebody say get over it yeah, get past your failures get past the pain get past the disappointment get past the what if this and what if that get past the embarrassment turn your back on your past face God's future because God has great things in store for you stand on your feet all over the building we hope and pray that you've been blessed by today's message and we're excited to extend an invitation for you to become a christian a devoted follower of jesus christ the bible says in john chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life For god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that through him the world might be saved if you want to be saved and have new life in jesus christ Pray this prayer, Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner 
and I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me of all of my sins, Lord. I turn away from my old life and turn now to you. I believe that because your son, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins, I am indeed forgiven. Now, God, I surrender my life to you, and by faith, I receive Jesus Christ and accept him as Savior, Lord, and leader of my life. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit, and thank you for giving me brand new life in Jesus Christ. Lord, I am forever yours. Amen. Now that you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is important that you become a part of a Christian fellowship. If you want to become a part of Base Memorials Church, you can call the number on the screen now, and someone will be there to share with you how you can become a part of our fellowship. If you're already a follower of Jesus, but wish to become a member of Base Memorial, you too can call the number on the screen and those on the line will give you information about how you can become a member of Base Memorial. If you desire prayer, go to our website, basememorial.com, click prayer, or you can call the number on our screen. We'll be waiting for you. Observe the Lord's Supper. It is the time we come together to commemorate and remember the great sacrifice that our Lord made so that we might have a right to the tree of life, how he died for a moment so that we could live forever. This is not my table. This is not Base Memorial's table. This is the Lord's table. And the Lord bids all those who've been born twice to come and to die. Paul said, for I've received of the Lord that which also I give unto you, that on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, broke it, and passed it, and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. After the same manner also, he took the cup after he had supped, and said, this is the New Testament in my blood, drink ye all of it. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do so show forth his death till he comes again. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this radical love you've shown by giving your son to save our souls, fix our hearts, and transform our lives. Father, we thank you for your son's willingness to do this on humanity's behalf. We ask your blessings over the bread, a symbol of his body broken that we might be made whole, and the cup, a symbol of his blood or life poured out. We might have life and have it more abundantly. Lord, you didn't have to do it, but you did. And for that, oh God, we give you thanks. And for that, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, one more time. You will now take your elements. Let us all eat and drink together. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. It's been another day and another opportunity to hear the word of God. And we trust that you've been blessed by the word of God that has been prepared for your soul's edification. We're able to do this because of the faithful giving of our congregation and people who may not be members of Bates, but they're friends of Bates and they want to invest in this ministry. If you're one of those people and you want to invest in this ministry, there are several ways that you can give. 
One way you can give is by cash app, dollar sign, Bates Memorial, and it'll get to our account. You can text to give. You can, the information should be on your screen. If you follow those instructions, uh, it'll get to our account as well. Or you can just go to basememorial.com and give on our website. Just click on the giving tab, follow the brief instructions, and uh, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Or maybe you'll do like some people do. They just come by. You know, they drop by uh, during the week as they're out and about, and uh, they just drop off their offering, and we make sure that their offering gets where it's supposed to go. If none of those ways appeal to you and you just want to mail it in, that's fine, too. Just mail it to Bates Memorial, 620, that's 620 East Lampton Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40203, and uh, it will make sure it gets where it's supposed to go. What's up, Bates Memorial family and friends? Listen, this is the year that we're serving with a made-up mind, and we've got a lot that you can get involved in. Check this out. Hey, what's happening, church family? This is Antonio Terrell, the youth director here at the Bates Memorial Baptist Church. Listen, the word of the month, I hope you can handle it, is love, lifting others verbally every day. The Bible says that love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't dishonor, it's slow to boast, it doesn't disrespect, it doesn't dishonor, it doesn't disvalue, none of that stuff. So this is what I want you all to do for the month of February. I want you to encourage somebody, lift somebody up. I'm telling you, you hold the keys to making somebody smile. Remember, love is the way. Be blessed. Hello, Bates family and friends. This is Minister Tony Phelps, staff accountant here at Bates Memorial. The main reason I'm here is to remind you that this will soon be time for us to distribute 2020 giving statements. Given the current pandemic and the need for us to continue to socially distance, we want to make sure that we have all the information we need to get your giving statements to you. Email is the most efficient way to deliver them to you. But if you prefer delivery by U.S. mail, we can do that too. That means we need to make sure that we have your most current contact information in our system. So we are asking that you go to our website at www.batesmemorial.com. Click on the membership tab. Enter your email and password and it will take you directly to your personal page or you can create your personal account if you have been signing in as a guest to give or you've been using Cash App. Then you go to the home and select profile and the drop down menu and from there you can update your address and telephone number and you can enter your preferred email address where we will send your 2020 giving statements. Now, if you need a little assistance, don't hesitate to call at 502-636-0523, extension 206, and we will be more than happy to walk you through the process. There is a saying, no man or woman is an island, which simply means all of us will need someone to lend us a helping hand at some point and time in our life's journey. So now that you have heard the why, it is our prayer as you will reach out to us whenever the need is there for you or your loved ones. We will be meeting virtually 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. every Thursday until we come back to in person. At that time, we will provide updated information on where we will be meeting. You can reach us by calling or emailing the church at 502-636-0523 or bmbc at basememorial.com or you can email me directly at wholder at basememorial.com. In the meantime and in between time, take good care of your mental health, stay safe, and keep your eyes and minds focused on Jesus, trusting God to always take good care of you. That's what's going on here at Bates Memorial, and we want you to get involved. Again, God bless you for tuning in. Spread the word about the broadcast if it's a blessing to you. We like to end with uh, prayer and the benediction, so let's go to God in prayer. Father, in, in Jesus' name, we thank you for uh, another word from you, God. We need a word from you. If we don't hear a word from you, we don't know what we're going to do. And so thank you, God, for this magnificent soul blessing word. And we pray, God, that we would not simply be hearers, but doers of the word as well and show your love every chance we get. We pray this prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Receive this benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee, the Lord. Lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace and give thee peace.
peace and give thee peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next time.